So why is it that I'm always talking about the culture? Why does the culture matter? You know, I, this is the thing about um, conservatives, political people in general, actually, that they think that stories matter because of the messages that they convey. Whereas I think stories matter because of the way stories work. And this is one of the key messages of the Bible, in my opinion, and one of the really fascinating ways that the Bible teaches us to look at, at, at human life, the humanity of life. Because, you know, there's a, there's a big philosophy, a, a very powerful philosophy going around, and I've, I've talked about this before, I'm not going to go on and on about it, but, but the philosophy basically that, the, the, that human nature is empty, uh, that it's either a blank slate or that it's wholly affected, created by powers outside itself. And that's why, you know, a lot of this comes from postmodern thought, but but that's why you get these, uh, what we call snowflakes, uh, complaining that, oh, you did violence to them because you won't admit that when a man says he's a woman, he is magically transformed into a woman. It's because they think that they are being wholly created from the outside. Whereas if you are a person who knows who he is or she is, uh, if you are a person who uh, is confident in yourself or at least confident in your identity, then nothing that anybody says can really transform you uh, or hurt you or damage you. But they are so have been taught that, no, they are empty vessels. Uh, wholly created by power structures outside themselves. And so until those power structures are corrected, um, until those power structures are corrected, they cannot be themselves at peace. And that's, that is a very damaging philosophy, but on top of everything else, it's untrue. And, you know, th there's a painting, a, a great illustration of this. Around here, there's a, a, a museum. What is it called? It's in Pasadena, the Norton Simon Museum. Um, great museum, really tiny little museum, but really a beautiful collection. And there's a painting there called The Birth of John the Baptist by Murillo, a Spanish artist. And I love this painting. I go sometimes just sit and stare at this painting. And there's so much I love about it. And one of the things I really love about it is the handmaid who's helping the nurse with the baby has a look on her face that I've seen on so many women's faces where she's looking at that baby and she just loves that baby and she wants a baby of her own. And you can just tell everything she's thinking uh, just by looking at her face. It's a, it's a master uh, a masterpiece of the, pa the painter's art. But what strikes me about this painting also, and this is very, very common in paintings of a certain era, is the little angels, the cherubs, watching the scene. And I'm sure you've seen this if you've ever been in a museum and seen any painting from before the 18th century uh, back into to the start of the Renaissance. You see this beautiful scene, and then you see the cherubs kind of watching over the scene, a guy dying, being lifted up by the cherub. And what it, it tells you is that there is a level of life, a level of life above this level. The things that are happening here are reflective of things that are happening there, that we don't just live in this kind of physical universe uh, where all that matters is our flesh, but in fact, there is a, an entire level of meaning that is going on uh, at, the, at the heavenly level, at the, in the mind of God. And that, of course, is the thing that these sort of postmodern leftist philosophies don't have is they don't have that all meaning is being created by us and therefore is infinitely malleable and infinitely flexible. And again, if you uh, won't confess to the meaning that the left believes in, then you're a danger. You're a danger because in order for that meaning to exist, the society has to have all, we all have to sign on in that meeting. And anybody who raises his hand says, you know, men really can't turn into women or, you know, uh, cops really aren't racist, but there's a lot of crime in black communities. And that you have to take that into account when you're thinking of that. Anybody who does that shatters the narrative. And without the narrative, the truth, uh, uh, the, the, without, since the narrative is creating the truth, if you shatter the narrative, you shatter the truth. And so what, what we believe instead is that we are reflective of other meanings. So there is no way, uh, the example I like to use is that if you give a beggar bread or if you are cruel to a child, those have meanings. One is good and one is bad. That's the meaning. You can't change that. You cannot change that and say, oh, if I kill this child in his mother's womb, uh, it's a woman's health. You can try, you can pretend, you can lie, but there will be a cost for telling that lie. And there is a cost for telling that lie. It is an atrocity and, and it is reflective of, our, of, our, of the baseness of our society uh, that, that we allow those things happening and eventually people will wake up to it, I, I do believe. 
So this is important. Your credit score is important. It actually is. You want to get a loan, you want to get a mortgage, all those things. It is an important thing. And what people don't know is that the average American has 97 points they can add to their credit score. 97 points. But they don't know how to get them. But who knows how? Scoremaster knows how. Scoremaster isn't credit repair, it's credit science, and it helps you get your points fast. The average Scoremaster user adds 61 points in 20 days. Getting your plus points fast can save you a fortune before you apply for a loan or credit card or refi your home or buy a car. Scoremaster is also great for business owners who use their credit score to finance their business. Scoremaster is even great for mortgage brokers who need an edge and love getting their clients better deals. Scoremaster is great for everyone. It even shows you the score consequences of spending too much or identity theft. No one else does what they do. Enroll in minutes and see how many points you can add to your credit score and how fast. Visit scoremaster.com slash Clavin. That's scoremaster.com slash Clavin. Clavin, the one thing they don't know how to do is spell Clavin. So I'll tell you, it's K-L-A-V-A-N. So how do you get from this meaning to that meaning? And how do you make sure that people know those meanings exist? Well, Jesus does it by telling parables. And, you know, this is a, um, a prophecy in Psalms. It says, it's read as the Christians read it as a prophecy in Psalms. He says, I will open my mouth in parables and utter the dark sayings of old. And this is quoted uh, in Matthew, I think, maybe Matthew, uh, as I will open up my mouth in parables and utter things kept secret uh, since the world was made. And Jesus is asked, why does he speak in parables? And he says, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more. This is also the parable of the talents. He says, whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. And that's one of, this is one of the hardest sayings of the gospels that those who have will get more and those who have not will lose even what they have. But what is it? That they have. It's not money, you know, no matter what Billie Holiday said, that wonderful song, uh, them, them what's got shall get, them what's not shall lose. So the Bible says, and it still is news. But no, he's not, he's not talking about money. He's talking about this insight, this insight or this willingness to embrace the insight that the world has meaning that the world it has fixed meanings. They may be vague meanings, they may not be perfect meanings, but it has meanings that can't be that aren't infinitely malleable. And we see this, he, you know, Jesus keeps saying that those who have ears to hear, let them hear. You know, those who have eyes to see, let them see. In other words, if you don't have those things, if you haven't got those, you will lose even what you have. And it's a very difficult thing. You know, uh, C.S. Lewis has a wonderful line in, I think, The Horse and His Boy, one of the uh, Narnia stories, where he says, uh, nobody hears any story, no one is told any story but his own. I use that as a front piece in uh, Another Kingdom. No one is told any story but his own. We don't know. We don't know whether everybody has the chance to hear. We don't know whether everybody is given the ears and maybe just refuses to use them. We just don't know. We have no way of knowing what other people's lives are like. We see people uh, who are taken down very, very dark roads, obviously, who t do terrible evil to themselves and to others. And we don't know, you know, was that, is that written? Did they, ha did they have to live that life or did they have a choice? I always believe that they have a choice. I, I believe that, but we don't know. We don't know those things. And there's the hard saying that, you know, those who have will get more. And what is it? It is the power to hear a story and understand that it's not just a story. So Jesus tells parables because the secret to a parable is, is not the meaning of the parable. See, I don't believe this. I don't believe that parables are so difficult to understand. I mean, they have many, many different meanings and many layers of meaning and all that, but I don't think that's what's hidden. What's hidden is the fact that the story has meaning. So Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons, right? Now you could say, well, which two sons? What were their names? Where did they live? But you don't, do you? You immediately say, okay, he's telling me a story. What's the story mean, right? And the very fact that you say that, the very fact that you say, what does the story mean is, is the fact that life has meaning because life is a story, right? Life is a parable, you know? And, and so th those parables, the fact that those parables have meaning and you can't get away from looking at those meanings is what Jesus is telling you about life. It, he's telling you what's ever in that 
individual parable, whichever parable it is, but it's the fact of the parable, the fact that he speaks in stories. And he's not doing it to make the medicine go down. He's like, he says he doesn't say that. He's not making it as propaganda. He's not doing it because it's more emotional. He's doing it because it tells you something about life itself. This is why the prophets, the prophets did this too. They acted things out, right? Hosea married a prostitute to demonstrate how Israel was prostituting itself. Jeremiah smashed a jar to show what God was going to do to Israel in his wrath. Uh, Ezekiel lay on his side, one side and then the other for more than a year, uh, eating bread cooked on crap, basically, to prophesy about the coming siege of Jerusalem. And, And John the Baptist did this too. John the Baptist was a voice crying, a literal voice crying in the wilderness to show figuratively that the messianic prophecies of the Bible were true. And in my opinion, Jesus did this with his entire life. His entire life was both a, pro- a, a, a life. He, all, he actually did the miracles that he did. He actually said the things that he said, but his life was also a parable of salvation. Now compare this to a man I frequently cite. And I cite him not because I don't like them, but because I actually admire his writing and his work and just strongly disagree with it. He's a guy named Yuval Noah Harari, he wrote a bestseller named Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. And what he says is that, quote, the ability to speak about fictions is the most unique feature of sapien language, of human language, that we create fictions. And these fictions create an intersubjective reality. It says intersubjective order existing in the shared imagination of millions of people. And these include religion, it's right, a fiction that we tell, but then we all believe in it. And so it becomes a sort of inner subjective, uh, intersubjective reality, nationhood, that America is a country. It's not just a hunk of ground, that Britain is a country. It's not just a, an island, uh, that these are fictions that we tell. Money is a fiction. There's no purpose uh, value to a dollar, but we say it has uh, value and that's a fiction. Uh, and laws and human rights are all fictions. He says, none of, he says, quote, none of these things exists outside the stories that people invent and tell one another. There are no gods in the universe, no nations, no money, no human rights, no laws, and no justice outside the common imagination of human beings. Why is this wrong? It is wrong. And why is it's, it's going to shock you that Jesus was right and Harari is wrong? Why? Well, let's say I have a pair of sneakers. And let's say you come to me for that pair of sneakers. And I say, how much? Uh, and you say, how much is it? And I say, it's $7,000. And you say, yeah, as if, right? You're not going to buy the pair of sneakers. Unless, unless, of course, you have to walk across broken glass and there's no other sneakers around, then you might pay a lot more for it. In other words, the sneakers have a value that we express in the fiction of money. We tell a story. The story is the story of money. He's right. That's a fiction. That's a story. But the story relates to something real, that between us, in the human mind, in the human heart, those uh, those sneakers have a value that we can compute without really knowing how we compute it. We don't fully understand how we compute it, so we use a story instead. Would we really say, would we really say that it's an entirely a made-up fiction that 17th century England was a country and 17th century Britain was a country? Is that really a made-up fiction? No, of course it's not. Of course it's not. It's a country, uh, and it's a plot of land inhabited by a race with common values, common ideas, common laws. And that is a fiction. The, the fact that it's that it's separated from other countries, aside from its geographical separation, that it's separated from other countries, is a story we tell that it's separated uh, from those other countries as an idea. It's a story we tell about a truth. It re- relates to a truth. If I said to you, oh, Russia and England are one country called Russ England, that would be a story that wasn't true, right? Because there's no relationship between those two countries. They're not one country. They don't operate in the same way. So stories, fictional stories, these are fictions. They are fictions, but they have a meaning, and that meaning is either true or false. And that is the big, big difference uh, between the postmodern ideas and the Christian ideas that we are trying to tell a story. And what do we learn from this? The thing that we learn is that everything we do has meaning. Our lives have meaning. Our actions have meaning. They have moral meaning. They have all kinds of meaning. And once you start to understand that, you start to understand that everything you want in life, everything you want in life is not itself. It's actually something else. And that is the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of wisdom. When you find out that the money you hunger for, the sex you hunger for, the love you hunger for, 
uh, the fame you hunger for, whatever it is you hunger for, is actually you hungering for something else. And that doesn't make those things worthless. It makes them stories that are telling about something else. They're telling about your desire, your need for God. That's what they're telling you about. Now, that doesn't mean you can turn away from them or should turn away from them. Maybe you have a talent that will make you famous. Maybe you want to work hard and get rich. Maybe you want those things. But if you make those things if you treat those things as themselves, they become idols. If you let money become an idol, your life will be your life will be ruined. If you let sex become an idol, your life will be ruined. If you understand that what you're looking for, what you're looking for is the life that God meant for you to have, and those things represent that life, then you treat them as they should be treated, and your life is entirely different. And that's why culture matters. That's why I'm always talking about culture, because we cannot understand the world without stories. We cannot understand the world without transforming stories into meaning, because it teaches us how to transform our lives into meaning.